Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here. I've just read the graphic novel adaptation of The Giver. Uh, the original novel, novel, The Giver, is by Lois Lowry. The uh, graphic novel adaptation is by P. Craig Russell, who also did Coraline. I have not read the novel, The Giver. I definitely think I'm going to go pick it up after this. So uh, when I picked this up, I was going into it expecting a lame dystopia. And my example of a lame dystopia would be anything where uh, you imagine the bad guy is, what if the people who voted for the guy I didn't vote for were in charge? Wouldn't that be terrible? Or after The Hunger Games, there was sort of a splurge of teenage dystopian fiction where it was always something goofy like, it's a dystopia, but they divide kids into video game teams, and then a teenage girl defeats the dystopia. <laughs> I actually like I actually like The Hunger, Hunger Games. I actually think that's a legitimately good dystopia, but... It's prompted a lot of really bad dystopia. And I think the trick to really good dystopia is it is it is supposed to trouble you. It is supposed to make you go out into the world and see, oh, great, all of these terrifying ideas from the dystopia world, I can see them in the world around me as a cautionary tale. And I think the three great dystopian novels are 1984, Brave New World, and Fahrenheit 451. All of them kind of borrow ideas from classic utopian novels like Utopia or like Plato's Republic. And the, the key to a good one, I think, is not just to like take your enemies and imagine your enemies in charge of the society, but maybe even to look at yourself and look at your own side and try to spot the evil or the dangers in your own ideas. So 1984 is a great example because... Uh, George Orwell was a socialist for most of his life, but in 1984, he's imagining what could be the problems of a socialist state with ab absolute power. So there's a self-critical aspect to it in something like, uh, oh, what's the Margaret Atwood one, the one, The Handmaid's Tale. What if evil Christian conservative fundamentalists were in charge and they took away women's rights? In V for Vendetta, he ba Alan Moore basically just stole the plot of 1984 and said, what if the uh, Ma Margaret Thatcher administration was in control of everything? What, what if the people I don't like on Twitter uh, were, the, were Hitler, right? Uh, but in good dystopia, I think you're latching onto something and trying to explain how evil works. And I think the best kind of evil in stories is – an evil which corrupts a good. It works for villains. So for a villain like Zuko in Avatar The Last Airbender, he's a villain who wants to honor his father. He wants his father to love him. He wants his father to give him honor again. But Zuko's father is an evil man. So Zuko is becoming evil in pursuit of what's really a good thing. In a good dystopia, Evil exists because a good is made into a god. In uh, Brave New World, I would say the good thing is equality. Equality is good, but in Brave New World, they make equality god, so no one is free. And really, no one is equal. They, they set up an arbitrary caste system to reinforce their equality. In uh, 1984, I would say something like unity is god or the state is god. So they observe all the people and they control language. In The Giver, the perverted good is community and family. And because community and family are made God, they actually destroy any real sense of community or any real sense of family. So I was kind of thinking, oh, this is going to be about evil family values Republicans ruling the world. It's not that. This is a genuinely good dystopia, uh, very thought-provoking dystopia. I put it in kind of the tradition of the great dystopias, but with its own really fresh take. I was reminded a lot of uh, Brave New World by it, but very successful at creating that haunting vision. So I'm just going to flip through it. Uh, I'll spoil things, but I will just kind of like talk about how effective it is as a dystopia. Before I start, I want to just say two things I think it does really well. World building. There's actually like a lot of thought put into how the world is structured. And even like every year, a child goes through a ceremony. So there's a lot of logical thought put into these ceremonies the children are going through. World building, 
character story. So 1984, everybody, you know, talks about it every every po political year. Uh, we hear about how, oh, no, my guy lost. It's 1984. Yeah, no, no. But uh, 1984 is also a fun adventure story about a guy who falls in love with a hot babe and has a lot of sex with her, which you forget if you just focus on kind of like the societal aspects of 1984. So The Giver also has a really, po really poignant story about a young boy realizing there's something wrong with the world and wanting to do something about it. So it, it succeeds at both levels. So with that, with those two kind of key traits in mind, let's hop into it. So uh, one neat contrast about this world is it's sort of like, like it took an idea from 1984, but instead of copying that idea, it imagined what would the opposite extreme be? So in 1984, there's Newspeak, and there are just word, words like good and ungood and double plus un, ungood. There isn't even a word like bad in Newspeak because they want to simplify language to rob you of thought, to rob you of any ability to rebel against the state because you have no thoughts or words to describe your thoughts. In The, in the Giver, it's the opposite problem. Everybody is very precise about their language, and there's a lot, like if you use the wrong word, it's a big deal. Use precision of language. If you make a mistake, the state always knows about that and reminds you about, about that. Sometimes they even allow a little rule bending, like little kids will teach their little siblings how to ride a bicycle, even if the rule says you're not supposed to ride a bicycle until you're age, your age nine. Everybody kind of bends that rule, and they'll joke about how they bend that rule. But still, even as they bend a rule, uh, it's it, it's sort of like they, they feel immense guilt for even violating small rules in their society. It's an orderly, structured, uh, dot, cross your T's and dot your I's society with basically no creative thought, no art, no history. They, they have no idea where they come from or what existed before the community existed, uh, which makes it the the exact opposite of 1984, 1984. You have all of this precision. You have all of this sort of like technical knowledge of logic and precision of language, but you have no meaning or memory associated with the word. So I kind of see this maybe almost as a postmodern spin on 1984, where they're making a point about language. If you can know the exact dictionary definition of a word, but if you haven't experienced love, knowing the dictionary definition of love isn't going to help you understand what love is. And in the society, all of these feelings have been stripped out of people because they're, they're painful. They're only sort of logical job machines. Uh, the main character, Jonas, is about to turn age 12, and age 12 is a coming-of-age ceremony. Uh, a good example of this is he uh, does volunteer work and he has sort of a erotic, a not quite erotic dream of a young girl about his own age where his parents realize, oh, he's hitting puberty. Now you have to take pills to uh, diminish these these feelings so you, you never feel this way again. You'll just habitually take take them. So the implication is that these are sexless marriages. The husbands and wives don't have babies. The husband and wives are assigned babies. Uh, and they clearly feel no sexual desire for, for one another. So there's this strong emphasis on family values, but these aren't real families. You don't have a real family if the husband and wife are not having sex. You don't have a real family if the state is assigning a, a child to you. Uh, so Jonas begins to take these p pills that take this these stirrings, uh, the, these, uh, you know, emotions away from him. Now, Jonas is uh, given a very special job, which is the job of the receiver. And what the receiver is supposed to do is the receiver is supposed to receive everybody else's memories. So nobody knows anything about the world before uh, their community existed. Nobody knows anything about a world outside of their narrow borders. They don't even have like words for things like nature or animals or feelings like starvation or loneliness. Uh, but the receiver bears all of this knowledge and he can't really share it with anyone. The only reason the receiver has this knowledge is so that he can warn the community away from doing dumb things that will cause them pain. But nobody else knows why. They just have to sort of trust the receiver, kn knows what he's talking about and trust in his wisdom. So it's a position that is 
honored. It, it, it's like an incre- it's an incre- it's the most honorable position to have. But nobody really understands it, and you're, it's sort of like you're forever outside of the community. You can never really share with the community what you're feeling or thinking because they're not allowed to have that knowledge. So Jonas begins to uh, receive the, this information from the giver. You know, he shows him, you know, warm things like sunshine and snow. They don't know what snow is. They don't know what going on a sleigh ride is. They don't know what love is. But he also has to share painful memories with him. And so this c- props up the conversation of, well, why do we do it this way? When the receive, uh, the old receiver They're both the receiver now, the old receiver and the new receiver. So he says, well, if I'm the receiver, what do I call you? And he says, call me the giver. Now I'm going to give you all of the memories I have received, and you're the the new receiver. So the giver explains to him that they removed color from life. They removed music from life. They removed difference from life. So there were once many different races. Now there's all only one color of, of race. And Jonas immediately concludes, we shouldn't have done that. And the giver is interested in this because he's had sort of like this rich intellectual thought life. He feels a bit trapped. He feels like he's stuck in a tragic world and he has no way to he has no way to fix it. All he can do is just hold on to these memories and keep passing them on. He's interested that Jonas has very quickly come to this con- conclusion. Is there anything we can do about this horrible uh, situation that we're in? So Jonas wonders, well, why do we do this? do it this way. Why don't we let children choose which color they like? And the giver points out he might make the right, the wrong choices. This is almost an exact parallel to Brave New World, where they take away freedom because they perceive freedom as just being the freedom to be miserable. Isn't it better if we just give you something to do for all of your life? And if you ever feel sad, you take a little Soma. It's Christianity in a pill. It's Christianity without the pain. Uh, if you, you just go participate in orgies all you want there because sex is meaningless. All sex is just a relief of your physical pleasures. There's nothing meaningful about reproducing and making babies. It's barbaric to, uh, make babies. That's the state's job to construct the babies for us through, through the wonders of industry. This is an exact parallel. Well, where the justification for taking away people's freedom and taking away people's human experience is justified by saying you're taking away pain from them. You're taking away the misery of having to live in a world of consequences and uh, you're protecting them from anything bad ever happening to them in life. But the receiver has to bear all of that for everybody else. So, you know, he shows him a memory of an elephant being hunted. He tells his little kid sister that who has a stuffed element, you know, there were once real elephants. She she just thinks that's a joke that she doesn't have a framework to even understand what this could, what this could be because there's such, there's such an isolated community. And that's just a little foreshadowing of the pain that Jonas has to go through. He can't share this with, with anyone. He feels trapped sort of within his own mind. Uh, Jumping forward, uh, the giver shows him the experience of love. And love is symbolized as family celebrating Christmas and grandma and grandpa are there around a fireside. And he kind of realized, well, you know, I see inefficiencies. Isn't it inefficient to have grandma and grandpa there? Isn't it a little dangerous to have a fire right there in the middle of a house next to a tree? But he's really, he really resonates with the feeling of love. The feeling of love is the giver's favorite memory that kind of helps him cope with bearing all of these dark and uh, uh, tr- truly tragic memories. And again, the justification is uh, the justification is that, that they have they have no way of even like comprehending what what this could be. Only the giver can bear that re- responsibility. Uh, what we're building up to is there's something called being released. And when you're a child, you're threatened, hey, don't be a bad child or you might get released. It's almost like a four-letter word where you don't want to casually talk about someone being released. And the idea is always held out there that maybe being released just means you go to another community. Maybe that's all it is. You can immediately, as I was reading, I was thinking, I bet being released means they put you to death. But it's a at, for most of the book, it's a big fat question mark, which kind of helps people cope with it. Maybe all that means is just they're being sent away and that, that's all there is uh, to to it. When a giver 
or when, 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 the, when the receiver of memory is released, somehow all those memories get transferred to the community. So the reason they don't kill the giver or the reason they don't just like banish the giver is if the giver dies or if the giver is released or runs away, somehow all that, the memory and the pain that the giver has is sucked out of them and indwelt into everyone else. So the, the problem they're trying to figure out is what the heck do we do about this situation if we agree that it was wrong for us to create a society like this? How can we possibly solve this problem. And the conclusion they gradually come to is we shouldn't be holding on to this. The people actually should be experiencing these painful emotions and learning to cope with these painful emotions so that they can have this wisdom too and not only have like one designated wise, wise person. Uh, flashing forward, uh, there's a subplot but uh, the subplots are woven together very well. There's a subplot where Jonas's father seems like a very kind and nurturing person. Uh, they, they are talking about potentially releasing a baby who is crying too much, and his father's a nurturer. So his father volunteers to bring this baby home and give this child extra nurturing with the hope that they won't have to release this baby. And, you know, his father's a pr professional. His whole job is to show love and give attention to young babies. But when he asks his parents, do you love me? They do not understand the concept. They, they, they say precision of language. That's a meaningless word. Uh, specifically, we take pride in your accomplishments. Uh, we enjoy, we enjoy being with you, but don't say, don't ask us to use inexact words like love. They have no concept of it because they don't have the experience of love to describe it. All they have is sort of a logical definitional outlook on life, a black and white view of the world, whereas Jonas has a colorful view of, of the world. Uh, flashing forward, Jonas starts to share little memories with the baby without asking his in instructor. Uh, I mark this because this is an example where I think that Lois is kind of missing a point a little bit. So uh, Jonas sees his friend's playing a game of like, you know, bad guys versus good guys where they shoot each other and play dead. He tells them, do not play that game. That game is a cruel game because it's a war game and he now has memories of war. This is the only scene I didn't like because I understand the point. The point is that Jonas now has knowledge of what war is and his friends are completely ignorant about what war is. To them, this is just a game. And so he sees a cruelty in boys playing at war because he thinks it's making light of the gravity or the emotional weight of what war actually is now, now that he knows what war actually is. The reason I don't like this scene is this is a scene that is a sort of typically female author scene where she sees boys playing at war and thinks, oh no, that makes light of war. It's so horrible to make light of war because war is horrible. War is horrible, but one of the ways that boys express their feeling is they play at they play at war and there's i think there's a moral difference between playing at war and uh I, I, tri trivializing war basically you can sort of see this in how people will complain oh little boys shouldn't be allowed to play with soldier toys because then that'll teach them that war is okay and war war is bad war is bad but virtuous war is good. War to defend yourself from an evil person is good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to get into pacifism, but I think that what's ironic about this scene is it's, it, it's sort of Lois saying boys shouldn't play at war uh, because war trivializes like this deeply help, felt human emotional tragedy of war. I actually think boys playing at war is a way of them expressing something, a, a deeply felt human need with, within themselves. Boys need to play at war or they're going to be pent up and not, not, it, it, it's something that's so important to boys is the expression of manly feelings. So that, that little scene annoyed me, but I understand the point narratively is that Jonas knows something that he can't communicate to other people. Now, the terrifying moment for Jonas is when he finally realizes what to be released means. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Being released means they put you to death. And so his father releases a twin. He sings a little lullaby as he does it. And the gut-wrenching tragedy of this is this whole time we perceived his father as a very nurturing and caring man, like a man who will go do like extra work to take care of a baby to stop it from being released. But when the community says too bad, we got to release this baby, he will do the injection and he won't feel bad 
as he does it. So, uh, it shows the injection, it shows the baby dying, it shows him putting the baby in a waste container and disposing of it. Oh, this hits so hard because this is, uh, th this is infanticide that an entire culture says is okay and that an entire culture mandates. I immediately, of course, make the connection to abortion and late-term abortion where even once the baby starts looking like a newborn little baby, it's still legal to do it in many states. It's still defended to do it on the basis of, well, society needs it. If we have these unwanted babies, it will hurt the mothers. It will hurt society. It is bad for us to have these unwanted babies. Therefore, it, for the good of society, we must do, do away with them. And this scene, it just hits so hard because Jonas now feels the weight of what this is, the, this destruction of a life, and nobody else can feel it and nobody else can see it because the society has guided their thinking to the point that, well, this is just the way things are done. When old people get too old and they can't contribute to society anymore, we release them. Uh, and we train little kids in the fine art of releasing these people. When babies are not useful for our society, we release them. This is connecting directly to an ancient idea. The Spartans would release children who were not useful for, who wouldn't be good Spartans. If you were a weak or deformed little baby, they'd put you out and let the wolves take you. In Roman society, if you were a weak little baby or your father just didn't want you, They'd put you out in the trash heaps and the dogs would, would eat you. And Christians had to go rescue those babies because Christians contributed this idea that, no, no, sorry, Rome. We know you think these babies are useless. We, uh, we believe uh, Christ teaches us that su suffer the little children to come unto me. Uh, the weak will inherit the kingdom of earth. The, the Christianity was a radical, strange idea compared to the Roman culture and society. So what's beautiful about a really good dystopia is it gets at something ancient. It is a really ancient idea that if a baby doesn't contribute to the society, that you just kill that baby because the society is more important to the baby. And Jonas feels the wickedness of it and no one else can see it. And it's driving him absolutely mad. So his conclusion is, well, we need to do something about this. And what would happen if I died? Well, if you died, all your memories would return to the community. Okay, what if I ran away and we told people that I died? And so the giver concludes, yes, I, based on our conversations, I've concluded that, you know, I've always felt that this was wrong and I had no way to do it. So what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to go away. The memories you have will be dispersed to the community. I have to stay here because they're going to be grieving and they need someone to help them. So I can't go with you. You're going to have to go alone. So he gives him every memory of courage and survival that he can and Jonas prepares to to go. And when he realizes that his father is going to uh, release the, the baby that he's been caring for, uh, and now that he knows what releasing is, he decides that he has to take the ba the baby Gabriel with him. When he flees, it transforms from a wor world of black and white to a world of color and a world of nature where things aren't uniform. Things are dangerous. Th things are exciting. Uh, he has a, he he experiences a lot of the things he he had memories of before. One of his first memories was of spraining his ankle, and the pain was almost too much for him to bear. Now he really sprains his ankle in real life, and he has to just keep keep going. He uses his memories uh, to try to survive in this situation. But as he's starving, uh, he thinks about how I could have chosen to stay behind, but Gabriel would have died. So even though I did make this choice to be out here starving to death, really, there was there was no choice if I wanted to save save Gabriel. The, the, the fact they were going to kill Gabriel left me no other option but to get out of that that wicked uh, community. And I'm going to go ahead and just spoil everything. It, it, it ends with his very first happy memory that he received was of sliding on a sled. Lost in the snow, he, he uses his memories of warmth to carry him on. He sees his sled and he slides down. And the implication is that he may freeze to death. It's not clear. It's a little abstract. So either he freezes to death and his – this is his final experience, and he's connecting his final experience with all of his memories. Or maybe he finds someone, maybe he hears singing and people come. It's, it's ambiguous. So we don't exactly know what happens to him. The implication is that he probably dies out there. But he dies 
having made a choice to live free in a dangerous world rather than to live as a slave in a, in a safe world all his life and having given Gabriel a chance at life rather than sort of the cruel uh, and cold d death that, that – uh, w was awaiting for them in the village. There's a little conversation with both the author of the book and the author of the graphic novel. Lois Lowry just sort of offers some uh, kind of baby boomer commentary like, man, I remember reading comic books when I was a little kid. That's kind of kind of interesting. She comments how almost nobody does the bathing scene because it's really hard to get away with doing a bath bathing scene. So she appreciated seeing P. Craig, Craig Russell adapt that. P. Craig Russell had some really interesting commentary on the adaptation process. So I would call this, a, uh, I haven't read the book it's based on, but I would call this a successful adaptation because P. Craig Russell is obviously very, very, very concerned with trying to communicate the original author's intent in a pictorial form and using the pictorial form as an opportunity to uh, heighten, heighten the artistic effect of the story or take, take the medium of books, which is an important medium, and translate it into the medium com of comics. So it works as a comic, but it's also as faithful as possible to the original author's vision. So I actually just kind of want to read this because I really appreciate the thought uh, P. Craig Russell put into this. Uh, have you ever read The Giver before? When he, he, he read it back in the 90s and he knew he wanted to do it. What was your first step in creating this graphic novel? Was there any image that immediately came to you when you uh, thought about taking on the project? My first step in any adaptation after reading the book is to tear all the pages out. I then place two faces facing pages face down on a copy machine and copy them onto 11 by 17 paper. This gives me enormous margins in which I can make thumbnail sketches and notes. Then it's a slow process of chipping away at it by underlining and sometimes streamlining dialogue and cutting out descriptive passages that are made redundant by the pictures. Some pictures immediately jump to mind and claim real estate on the page, while other scenes resist visual visualization. If those resistance scenes can be solved, they frequently are the most interesting in the book. So the problem is, how do you translate abstract, non-pictorial information into graphic novel formats? So he has to like, actually put some thought into that, and I appreciate that. Throughout The Giver, Jonas begins to see color in a world that has previously appeared black and white. How did you want to approach this unique challenge for the graphic novel? The ideas in the book are, of course, what are most important about it, but it was the great visual theatrical coup of the sunrise in a colorless world halfway through chapter 21 that sealed the deal for me. Prior to that was the challenge of making a black and white world interesting. My solution was not to do it in black and white. I feared basic black and white would simply look like a graphic novel without the budget for color. So I relied on a technique I've used a few times before. I drew pencil. I drew, penciled the book in blue pencil and did the finished traditional ink line in pencil with a soft HB lead. I let the blue show through and sometimes even used it to fill in sky or water. I then used ink wash, that is ink mixed with water, to give various tones of gray to the drawings. This blue silvery tonal look gave life to the page, while at the same time giving the look the look of a world without color that stark black and white would not and you can see it throughout and it really really helps the fact that it's not simple flat black and white it basically says this is a black and white world without using a boring black and white page format so that was that was a brilliant solution uh, much like much like jonas discovers new emotions as he begins to experience memory and color readers will discover something new about the giver through your illustrations what is one thing you hope readers, old and new alike, will discover about The Giver through your artwork. I'm al I've always remained exceedingly faithful to the themes of, and ideas of whatever source material I'm working with whenever I do an adaptation. But at the same time, whenever you use source material to produce a new work of art, whether you're turning a short story into a film, a play into an opera, or a novel into a graphic novel, these new works have to succeed by the dictates of their new form. In other words, your final work has to be judged as a successful film, opera, or graphic novel. Lois Lowry's ideas remain intact and, I hope, are strongly sustained in this adaptation. What I hope the new reader brings away from it is an appreciation of the range and capabilities of this visual form and its potential to convey abstract ideas visually. 
Was there a scene in The Giver that was particularly challenging to bring to life visually? I always talk about the challenge of those pages I call scenes without pictures, scenes that have no dialogue where I can show characters engaged in conversation and no avert action to stage. In The Giver, the challenge was in showing the transfer of memories, such as Jonas transforming Transferring warmth to Gabriel in a visual way. For this, I use, let's see if I can find it. Actually, if I skip ahead, maybe he basically puts the, the visual idea in a word balloon. I can't find a page, so I'll just, for this, I use the traditional word balloon or bubble to hold the image. The balloon pointer showing which character was holding the thought and then slowly retracted that pointer and slowly advanced it toward the receiver of the thought. A solution that's much simpler and cleaner to look at than it is to explain. That's right. So it's easier to see how it works in comics than to explain verbally how it works in comics, but great idea. How do you visualize a world of sameness in an interesting way? How do you make a gray world visually exciting? Utilizing the plasticity of panel design helped bring visual stimulation to the page, even as the world within the varying panel shapes retained its cookie cutter definition. And Lowry's slow introduction of color in Jonas's brief glimpses of red kept anticipation alive of brighter things to come. I avoided the temptation to draw a future world futuristically. Nothing looks more dated, more of its time than a vision of the future is seen 30 years later. Instead, I went backwards and placed the community in something of a retro 50s world or even further back with the Miami style Art Deco houses. He wanted something that would be timeless and something that wouldn't look corny in a few years. Great idea from a design perspective. Uh, and then kind of like ask the questions like, isn't art important? And kind of like says, yep, art's very important. And the, he puts the giver in kind of the category of 1984 or animal farm. So I agree. Uh, this is a excellent graphic novel adaptation. The graphic novel adapter took very seriously the author's original intent and put a lot of intelligence into adapting it into a su successful novel. Uh, the themes of Lois Lowry, the original author, are absolutely fantastic. This should be, I think this should be one of the great uh, dystopias. It very beautifully and brilliantly uh, remains true to the ideas of what makes a great dystopia work. Uh, I, I had that one scene that kind of annoyed me a little bit, but the, the overall, I think this is a, uh, this is a masterpiece because it correctly identifies what a dystopia is supposed to be. And it's a very creative idea to the classic dystopia tradition. Check it out. I'm No More Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.